Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. People write memoirs for a variety of reasons, to fill in gaps in their family histories, to better understand how they became the people they are, and to memorialize the people, places, and events in their lives whose stories could be lost if they didn't tell them. In her new book, Native Country of the Heart, writer and activist Cherie Moraga writes about coming of age on the Mexico-California border in the 1960s in a community of Mexicans of mixed Indian and Spanish ancestry, about coming out as a gay woman years before the gay rights movement took off, and about becoming a Chicana feminist in the midst of the women's movement of the 1960s. Most of all, though, her book tells the story of her mother, Elvira, the tiny Mexican woman who was the heart of a large and warm extended family of mestizos and her ordinary but remarkable life. The book has been published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Welcome. Thank you, it's good to be here. So why did you write this book? Um, I wrote it, uh, I think, above all else as a sort of um, honoring of my mother um, and also recognizing that her story and her generation story. She was born in 1914 um, as a Mexican woman in the United States is um, a part of American literature that's seldom been written. You write that you had only one romance, your romance with your mother. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Now you have a significant other, long time. Oh yes. But only one romance. Well the romance, I think I, I'm saying that, you know, kind of in the larger sense of of, of, of what is romantic, right, in our lives, right? And I think that the one romance saying is like, when you say, what is the, who is the great love of your life? And it sort of sets the tone for the rest of your loving, you know? And that's who my mother was to me. Then a certain level, the kind of person she was, her relationship um, to, to family, her relationship, she had such a strong sense of, of values. Um, and also her, her relationship to desire, you know, which was never quite, fully requited in a certain level in her life. Um, that kind of came this sort of whole panorama of, of what I understood as feelings and love. And so in a certain level, she became the kind of uh, prototype for me in that way. And, and then, you know, I think that I've written elsewhere that, you know, family is a place that for better, or for worse, we learn to love. And I think that's what I meant about the romance part. So briefly, tell me about your mother, I mean your father, where they came from and how they met. Um, well, my mother um, was born in Santa Pala, California, and my father was born in San Francisco. There's, all, there's about eight years difference. She was older than him. Um, but the, uh, for her, her life was one of, and she began in her early years from a huge family. And they were, you know, basically, um, through this whole southern area of, of California, um, they were uh, farm workers. My grandfather apparently also did contracting where he would then contract his own family out to work in the fields um, and negotiate those contracts. Um, but they were, this is my memory of her earliest stories about them being in, the, in as farm workers. Um, through, a, you know, during when the depression hit, and this is where her story takes on a very distinguished sort of twist is that she moves, the family gets moved down to Tijuana. So my mother at 14 began to work at Agua Caliente racetrack and casino. And she was one of those, you know, uh, this is like the 1920s, so in the, into the early 30s, a cigarette and hatchet girl. And that was her romance. That was a period of time that she went from being a farm worker to like kind of rubbing elbows with like, you know, all of these actors, Clark Gable, all these people. And I think that there's a line in the book that says, you know, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've been to Tijuana in the 30s? Because there is a way in which, as a, little, as a young woman, she got this glimpse of this very cosmopolitan life, you know, that only lasted, you know, for several years in her life, and they returned to Los Angeles. And when she returned to Los Angeles, I mean, she went back to factory work. I mean, she didn't have education. So her, her the, and, you know, eventually it was after World War II that she met my father. Um, who, you know, has he basically worked for the railroad his whole life. You know. And so your mother, I mean, she did a lot of work. She worked, uh, she took an ironing, she worked at the factory, and eventually she started to manage a hotel that was left to your father? Father's mother um, through a, had been a vaudeville actress, 
and in San Francisco. And then through a series of events, um, she ended up like managing this kind of uh, uh, like a single occupancy hotel um, that, that was right across the street from Huntington Beach. But this is like in the 40s, right? Eventually through managing it, she began to be able to pay for it and she bought this hotel. And your father sort of, he went from job to job. He wasn't a great earner. No, he, well, he was a very steady earner. Oh, okay. Yes, he was a very steady earner. Um, but uh, again, he always worked, what he did is he, he it, when World War II, he learned to be a telegrapher. Okay. And so he used that skill to start to work in the Santa Fe Railroad. And basically kind of, you know, there wasn't a lot of movement about where you went in terms okay. of, you know, his job. But he was a, a, you know, he had a union and he was a stable earner, just not a, you know, it was later in life where he, after he retired, where he actually started a little income tax business for himself. That so you spent it, a lot of time, well, first in Pas South Pasadena, then in San Gabriel. Both are really parts of Los Angeles yeah, County. Right, yeah. um, and you describe your child as a happy Mexican-American childhood. Right. What was well, that like? Well, I guess what, you know, about that is to say... Um, you know, and say happy. You know, I think the happy part was my relationship to this huge extended family, and we had relations that were all those neighboring towns in San Gabriel Valley. We were all lived around there, and my mother was the first one to move there, and um, our family was. And then my grandmother lived next door to us, and my grandmother was born in uh, Sonora, Mexico, and. So, and she was Spanish speaking only. And, but because of our proximity to her, all the family was always in our midst. And I think there was a certain sense I had about a certain kind of cultural abundance. Yeah. That always made me, gave me a strong sense of what values of family and, uh, and also what home meant. Yeah. Your mother never finished elementary school, but you and your brother and sister all went on to college. Was right. that? the influence of the uh, Catholic, Roman Catholic education you got growing up? Well, I think um, it mostly was influenced by the fact that my mother didn't have an education. And because of that, she always sort of bemoaned the fact like, that maybe if she had an education, her life would have been different, you know, in terms of her own success as a person. And uh, like she wouldn't have had to work factory. You know. So did she push you all to get a college education? Well, she pushed us all to get a high school education. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, that was like, well, I remember when, when I graduated from high school in the first year of college, I'm going, man, this is hard. And I was like, and my mother was okay, mija, you know. You know, you got your high school education, you're going to do fine. And when she said that, that gave me more desire to go back to school. Like, I didn't want, like, she said, you could work in a bank or be a secretary <coughs> like that. And I had... You know, I had broader notions, but for her, that was success, right. you know. So I think that, um, but, you know, I had a, I mean, the, the schools, the Catholic school I went to, you know, on many levels uh, were things that the, the kind of the, the Catholic education I got was also very hard on me, you know, because I already knew from the time I was very young about, uh, about being queer and, you know, my sense about, um, uh, all those things are like any kind of growing consciousness you have as a young girl, that I knew the church rules were not in my favor, you know. But the schooling I got in high school in particular was very good. The, the schooling, okay. the actual classes, what yeah, I learned, and, right, you know, that, right. there was, it was solid. That was in solid. your college years, uh, this is when you stopped going to church, uh, started wearing mostly pants, I think slept with your with boyfriend. Yeah. Um, came out to your mother as a lesbian and, and began to move into the lesbian life in Los Angeles. How did your mother or react to that? I don't know if your father reacted in any way. How did they react to that? Well, actually, you know, my, my, my mother was always the key person. So if my mother was okay with something, then my father was. It was kind mm -hmm. of like that. And um, Well, the book describes that moment, you know, very uh, specifically. And I, I think kind of the heart of it is to say that, you know, uh, it, it was one of the most difficult conversations I ever had with my mother. And I was planning to leave Los Angeles to move to the Bay Area, which I've made most of my life has been in the Bay Area. And at the point in which I decided to leave, um, I had packed my bags, I'm ready to go, and I was living in Los Angeles. But I came for a family barbecue 
And, but before I came, I'm calling my mom up and I'm saying, you know, I'll be there at <laughs> such and such a time. And, and then she says, you're not going to come earlier. And I said, well, no, you know, just I'll be. And I had been like staying away a lot because when, once I came out, I felt like I had this secret life. And my decision was to move to the Bay Area because I felt like there was no way in the context of my, 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 Mexican, my Mexicanism, my mother's values, and, and, and also uh, Catholicism that I could um, ever be out with in the context of my family. And so I had in my mind, I'm leaving, you know. And my mother says to me on the phone, um, you're leaving with a secret, you know. And that, to me, was indicative of the quality of my mother, that above all else, she asked me for the truth because she knew I was leaving. And she knew I was really leaving. It wasn't just I was going to go, you know, leaving geographically. I was going to leave with a secret life. Right. You know. And to her credit, you know, she says that, and I'm kind of busted. You know, I mean, I, I'm at the moment which I could keep on lying, but she's asking me for the truth. And when I told her the truth... You know, I mean, basically, and it's described in the book. But the heart of the matter is, is that she says to me, how could you think there would be anything in this life that you could do that you would not be my daughter? And that was, I was good. That was We're going to time. take a short break. Then we'll be back with Cherie Moraga, author of Native Country of the Heart. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Cherie Moraga, author of Native Country of the Heart. So you're out um, as a gay woman, and you discover feminism. How did you um, become a feminist? Oh, th um, I think that was probably you know, 20 years in the making, you know, on a certain level. It just, it was a, you know, I was going to a, a college, Immaculate Heart College at the time, which was a very, um, it, it, the name is misleading because it was actually a non-sectarian and co-educational college by that point. But it was a very, very progressive school politically. And the nuns who founded that school were the first nuns to, um, throw off their habits. Throw off their habits, right? And it's a period of time, you know, and it's like I graduated from college in 1974. It was a period of time in which all this activism is happening around all the social justice movements, the people of color movements, the queer movement, the feminist movement. All of them are beginning to kind of one roll over, you know, evolving out of one to the next. And so, um, you know, I remember the first time Gloria Steinem came to the college to speak, right? And I knew I wasn't that wasn't my life, you know, but I did know that at the heart of it, to really look at the ways particularly, and this has been my work, is to look at the specificity of, of oppression that we experience around sexism and patriarchy and all those questions. I never had language for that, but I did know that I was raised with a double standard. I did know that there was like a cultural specific version of my feminism which brought me not just to feminism, but to Chicano feminism, to women of color feminism. That I felt like that when we're talking about our liberation, you know, as human beings, that we need to look at our liberation in terms of what are the particular cultural conditions of how we were raised. So for me, you know, as a little girl, I understood that, you know, I made my brother's bed, I picked up his clothes, I waited on him, I gave him money from, you know, my, you know, my piggy bank for him to have dates, you know. You see those, you know, those are kind of small things. But also, I was raised with the double standard about men got to be free and women didn't, you know. And I, But well, was know, Chicano feminism different from black feminism? Um, I'm sure, I mean, uh, black feminists have often talked about, you know, their issues were different from white feminists. Right. But was Chicano feminism different from black feminism? Or well, were they I think similar? I mean, the point of it is, is that in 19, uh, 1981, Gloria Ansaldúan and I published this anthology um, called, um, that we co-edited called This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color. And that book <coughs> really answers that question because, no, on a certain level, we were responding to a white feminism that was completely class biased and, you know, and didn't have any understanding sort of the complexity of how racism impacts also, you know, women of color's lives. So technically, 
you know, you're, as a black feminist, your issues run the same categories as mine, right? But there is specific ways in which I was raised in the particular conditions of my feminism um, that's informed by our history, you know? And so the history of Mexico, the history of even the colonization of Mexico, like if, if African Americans are looking at the history of slavery and, and you're talking about liberation, then I have to look at the conquest of Mexico. Right. You know, so those are the important things that, particularly as a teacher, when I try, you know, you're kind of teaching these things, and I, as a creative writer, that those, it's the specificity that really helps people go home. You spent some time in Boston, New York, um, hanging out with feminists here and getting your book published, and um, what was that like? I was incredibly fortunate in the fact that when I came when I came east for the first time to look for a publisher for this book, This Bridge Called My Back, some of the people that I met, when I think about it now, how, how important this was to me, is that I met, you know, a whole group of black feminists, but in particular, Barbara Smith and Audre Lorde of that time, who they were in terms of, and they were also, you know, they were also lesbians, so they were black feminist lesbians. To me, it's like when you were saying, what's the difference, you're absolutely right, because because on a certain level, all the categories of things that they were f confronting in their own lives and as writers that they were looking at, I was a young writer, that I said, I can bring that home, right? That they became a model of sort of, of how we understand oppression and also how we understand the road to our freedom, you know? That they were my teachers okay. on a certain level. And then you did take that home. You went back to California. You yes. felt you needed to go back to California. Yes, because because New York in the 80s, I mean, does not have the Mexican population it has now. I mean, basically, the only Mexicans I knew were at Columbia University, a small group of those first kind of, you know, affirmative action students. So I needed, you know, the work that I needed to do and the books that, that would come soon after that meant that I had to take, I had to take it home, you know. Um, so... You go back home, and there are things going on with your parents during this time. For one thing, your mother starts to, at some point, start showing signs of dementia. Yeah, that was that was fairly recently. In the sense that that was like she was already in you know her late 80s. Uh huh. So, but I had made my life in California as a writer and and teacher, and she they remained in San Gabriel, and I lived up in the Bay Area. The book is there. My mother's Alzheimer's and her loss of memory that initiated this book, that made me want to then recollect my mother's story. Um, and also to look at sort of questions of, of memory culturally, you know, that I feel like there's a lot, especially for us as Mexican Americans, that we're told that we're just supposed to assimilate, right? And I feel like that on a certain level, what I feared is that with the loss of my, my mother's generation, and they all have gone passed on now, that what were we what were we left holding? Yeah, you know, and so that the book became in many ways trying to to recollect that for my mother and for her generation. So um, it would not be lost. So it would not be lost. Yes. You write that what the Moraga family shares with multiple generations of Mexican of Mexican and Mexican Americans is the denial of your native origins, that you drank the bitter Kool Aid of colonization. Um. Was it your Indian origins that, that you denied? And was it whole this assimilation process and you were losing touch with your Indian origins? Was that what was going on? Well, it's a complete, I mean, it's very complicated, right? I mean, because when we're talking about the history of, of Mexicans and Mexican Americans, <laughs> right, in the United States, <clears throat> the vast majority of Mexicans you know, and Mexicans is, is the name of that nation state, right, of Mexico, right? But there are, there are hundreds of native origin people, right? I mean, hundreds of native groups, right, different nations. You know, you're talking about, you know, uh, Tarumara, the Odami, it's like you could go in, people know of the Maya, the Quiche, I mean, that's in Guatemala. There's just all these native communities. With the colonization of Mexico, and we became Mexicans, like the way we're Americans, right? But we're Americans, but you don't forget that you're black. Right. Right? Well, in, the, in Mexico, it's like you're now Mexicans and forget you're Indian. And so the vast majority of Mexicans, even though they may be, you're talking about blood quantum, could be 
you know, native, you know. In fact, you know, unless you are in your traditional community and you speak your indigenous tongue still and you wear your traditional clothes, and this is beginning to change so much, but then suddenly you can just go into the city and lose the fact that you're, you're native. And so we're talking about 500 years of also just being told that we're no longer indigenous, even though people still practice, you know, when even you look at Catholicism, the way, you know, Mexicans practice Catholicism, there's so much indigenous in it. Yeah. Right? So partly the road about remembering who we are when you're talking about, you know, not assimilation, what it means is to also acknowledge, you know, that we are not just another immigrant population, that we have been here from the beginning of time. And that brings also to, to young people a sense of, you know, it's like, like oh, until now with all the anti-Mexican and anti-Latino, you know, uh, uh, propaganda that's going on about the fences and, you know, the, all of this stuff from Trump, it's like, the, the, the idea of who we are as a people is so distorted, right? And so I feel like partly this book was about trying to really show the complexity of the Mexican-American and Mexican experience. What has happened to that Mexican-American community that you grew up with in, in, in San Gabriel? You know, there's always new generations of Mexicans coming in. I mean, the, you know, there are people in San Gabriel that have always been there from the beginning of time. They are, they are Tongva people. And many people, including my tío by marriage, you know, was a person who admitted to me that we were, the, we were the Indians who built the mission, right? This consciousness and this recognition throughout California of people's indigenous origins in California in very recent years, I would even say in the last 10 years, has really begun to surface. Okay. And so it's an interesting sort of new, you know, an, an important development, I think. So what are you talking about when you're talking about the native country of the heart? <clears throat> I'm just talking about, you know, to me, I think that, and I have a really strong belief, and I've always felt this, and I think this has to do with being an artist, you know, and a creative writer, is that I do feel like, and this is what I learned from my mother in the midst of her Alzheimer's, is that even when she forgot something, her body remembered. I mean, that she would do actions that she had done her whole life. I mean, even at one point, and she became very ill, and she had to go to a, a memory-impaired place, and she was still going around cleaning up the the rooms, right? The trash cans, you go, Mom, you don't have to do this, you know, and it was mostly Anglo people but there. She'd always She'd always done people. it. She'd always done it. So the native country, the heart to me is body memory. You know, is that inside of us that we do hold memories and we do hold knowledges that even I do believe that our DNA remembers, you know. And that partly the way we become ignorant in the United States is we forget. We forget we're getting messages from us all the time about this is not right or this is, and it's not intellectual. It becomes intellectual. But you know, it's like a, a friend of mine, she's a Yoruba practitioner and I, I really respect her and she had said to me, you know, until head knowledge becomes heart knowledge, you don't know anything, mm -hmm. you know? And that's what I'm talking about. The native country, the heart for me, is my right to be all the complexities of who I am. And I don't, when I say I, I don't mean me personally only, I mean us. Right. That as Mexicans in the United States and Latinos, you know, we have a right to remember our origins. Here, I was just talking to some students at Brooklyn College. You know, I'm looking at it and it's, a, you know, the, they're all mestizos. And in that view, I'm looking at all the Africanos, you know, all the African that's in, right in front of me, you know. And it's like, so you're thinking to yourself, if you can, walk in the world with that knowledge of your origins, right? That you then, and particularly young people, they will have a counter narrative to the Trumps in the world, you know? That they will be more fortified to move through this world with some kind of self-love and self-knowledge, you know, that they have a right to be mm -hmm. here, right? Well, it's certainly a, you give us a glimpse into the life of a community that doesn't get written about very much. Exactly. We don't know much about, Yes. you know? Yeah, yeah. And the, these are not um, really immigrants. These are American, Mexican yes. Americans. Yes, yes, they are. Uh, they and they are Native American right. in that sense, right? right? And the irony of it is, is that I mean, it's the East Coast West Coast thing too. You know, I mean, we're the majority in California. Yeah. Right. And so, and I think too is that you know there is works that, are, that come out, and more films, et cetera, but it's always the immigrant experience. Yeah. It's never this, this whole other body of people. And I'm, I'm glad the work comes out and, and 
I also feel like with all the, with the caravans and all that, I think it's also our job, you know, as Latinos in the United States to continue to identify with those people. You know, there's also to this, identify with the to other keep, immigrants. Or? Yes, the ones that keep coming in. Yes. That we, you know, you keep, you know, it's like yes, they are being forced from their homes. Yeah. Nobody, I and mean, it's like everybody thinks that everybody wants to come here. It's like the, it is, it is the civil wars going on, the drug cartels in Mexico, the loss of land. All of this has happened since actually even if from for a long time, but from the first NAFTA in the 90s, yeah. you know. And so you see that, and I can see sometimes with more, you know, people don't, oh, those aren't us anymore. You know, we're here, we're Americans. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that we are also obligated to make sure that, you know, that we, we, we allow them and we also provide voice for them, okay. right? I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, I want to thank Cherie Moraga for joining me today. Native Country of the Heart, a memoir, is published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. It's available online and in bookstores. For One to One and the City University of New York, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.